Guess what time it is? Showtime. That's right. It's showtime. All right. So what we got to do to continue on with our... Uh, we only got two pages of notes this time. You happy about that? <laughs> but don't worry. There's a lot to unpack. So um, what we're going to do, part two, the southern kingdom. So we got to flip back to 1 Kings chapter 14. It's just easier instead of... Because when you go through and you read ever since the split and you read it to the end of 2 Kings... It goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So it's just easier just to talk about the north first, and then we'll talk about the, the, the south. All right, so um, basically the overview of the southern kingdom is that there are a few good kings. Just a few of them. We're going to look at them, Hezekiah and Josiah specifically towards the end. But the majority of these kings are just like the northern kings. They just get worse and worse and worse. So even with these good kings, it's basically like the cycle of corruption, Reform, worse corruption. Reform, worse corruption until ultimately enough's enough. It's time to just um, purge the sin out of the city, which is exactly what God does. Now, remember, in the north, there are various dynasties. All kinds of dynasties. I don't, in fact, I don't even remember how many there are. But, you know, there are the coup d'etats. This general would rise up. Rehu, for example, would rise up and kill the entire, uh, the entire dynasty of him that went before him. And, but in the south, it was always... A descendant of David. Every single king in the south was a descendant of David because of the covenant that God swore with David back in 2 Samuel 7. Your dynasty will last forever. And ultimately, this is going to be a problem because Zedekiah is the, we're going to, we're going to see this in a moment, Zedekiah is the last king. His sons are killed before him. He's hauled off to, uh, to exile, and that's it. And there, whatever happened to the covenant, whatever happened to the promise. So that's just a little teaser for you. It's like a trailer for you, just to tease you a bit, and we'll get back to it, okay? So let's look at 1 Kings chapter 14 and get back to Rehoboam, Solomon's son. And I hope you're not too, I know it's confusing, you know, all these names, Rehoboam, Jeroboam, Ahaz, Ahab. Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah you seriously, passed, passed the Advil. Take a swig of scotch and just, you know, try to keep up. Um, it's, it's tough. I know it's tough. And I, I apologize. I, I blew it. I totally forgot to bring a, a printout of the various kings and stuff. But hopefully next week I can, I can bring that for you, okay? But just hang in there, okay? We're just looking at some highlights. And what you have to understand is, you know, this is the period of the divided kingdom leading up to the exile because of their unfaithfulness to God. That's really the main point, okay? With some really awesome typology in between, Okay? All right. So Rehoboam is the king of Judah. This is my fire effect again. He is doing evil. So that's, that's the pattern. If there's evil, there's fire. Judah did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They provoked him to jealousy with their sins that they committed more than all their ancestors had done. For they also built for themselves high places. In other, in other words, these are altars, high places for worship. And they weren't supposed to do that. Where were they supposed to go and worship? Jerusalem, the temple, and only the temple. All right, they built sacred poles on every hill and under every green tree. That's um, hyperbole there. But they, there were also male cult prostitutes in the land. They committed all the abominations of the nations that the Lord had drove out before the people of Israel. They fell into all these evil practices. Uh, and remember, we talked about this back in Deuteronomy. We talked about it in Joshua. The people were supposed to get the people out of the land, even to the point of harem warfare because Moses knew God knew they were going to fall into these great sins and so here we have it as we saw with the northern kingdom there is all kinds of sexual depravity and, and, and wickedness there is incest there is adultery there is homosexuality there is all, all kinds of fornication bestiality all kinds of bad stuff but they also sacrificed human beings they sacrificed their children it was awful you guys you can't overestimate the wickedness that they committed so Rehoboam fell quickly and it just continued on from there so that's letter A. We're going to move on to Ahaz, 2 Kings chapter 16. Remember, I'm just painting broad strokes for you now, so don't panic too much if we don't spend a lot of time on it. 2 Second, uh, Second Kings, we, we, we skipped a whole bunch. We skipped a whole bunch because we just don't have time. We, went, <laughs> we jumped from 1 Kings 14 to 2 Kings 16 because I really want to spend a lot of time on some of the latter kings of of the, of the kingdom of Judah, okay? So we jumped. Major, major jump. 
Almighty. So Ahaz, 2 Kings chapter 16, here we have verses 2 and 4. He did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. He even made his son pass through fire. In other words, he even sacrificed his son according to the abominable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. He sacrificed and made offerings on the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. It just gets worse and worse and worse. So that's all in 2 Kings 16. But if you read into 2 Kings 17, what he does next is also extremely bad. He, I'm going to just spend a little bit of time, just a moment or two, contextualizing something. All right, actually, we're still in 2 Kings 16. I apologize. Jumping back and forth. 2 Kings 16. What's going on here is that the king of Israel up north, as well as the king of of, uh, Syria, are teaming up on him, putting a lot of military and political pressure on him. They're basically trying to defeat him. So instead of turning to Yahweh, instead of turning to God and imploring help, who does he turn to? Assyria. He turns to Assyria and he tries to establish this relationship with him, okay? And of course... Assyria was was a growing power at the time, and he managed to overthrow this threat levied levied on him by Israel and Syria. Okay, you with me so far? I know it's like, oh my goodness, even more. Syria, Assyria. It's like if I'm talking too fast, you miss the A and you're just gone. All right, but that's what's going on. What Ahaz did now was he saw the altar in Damascus. And he decided he was going to make an exact replica of that pagan altar. And he built a replica in the temple and sacrificed and offered incense on it in the temple itself. All right, very bad stuff what's going on, not only morally, but liturgically, and so on and so forth. It just gets really bad. But it's at this point, Ahaz is the king to whom Isaiah the prophet speaks about the virgin bearing a son. And we talked a little bit about this uh, during Advent, when we talked about the Advent of the Messiah. It's at this point when, when Ahaz is looking to establish this relationship with Assyria, that Isaiah comes to him and says, ask for a sign of Yahweh, any sign of Yahweh. And Ahaz, with this false piety, says, oh, no, no, I'm not going to ask of a sign from God. That would be to test the Lord. Here he is offering his son on the, you know, as a sacrifice, building these pagan altars in the temple, living a life of adultery, and all, it's all false piety. Isaiah sees right through him, and he says, "Look, the virgin. I will give you a sign. The virgin is with child and shall bear a son, and you shall name him Emmanuel." This is the context of the prophecy, okay? Now, what's important here, sometimes a lot of non-Christians will argue that this is not referring to Jesus Christ. It's referring to Ahaz's son, Hezekiah, who will be like God with us, okay? Who is going to be a great reformer king. All right, so what they say is, the Hebrew word for virgin is Alma, Alma, which basically means maiden. I mean, the, the maiden will be uh, with child and bear a son, and you shall name him God with us. So, like, no, that refers to Hezekiah, they say. Because, you know, you, I don't need to put up a slide. We know all the birds and the bees, right? Ahaz takes a young maiden... She conceives, they have a son, and Hezekiah is a reformer king. Basta, right? (laughs) You like that? It's my Italian coming out of me. I speak more than basta. I speak pasta, too. (laughs) Anyways, moving on. We're getting distracted here. Pull it back in. What's important to recognize is that prophecy has a dual fulfillment. It does refer to Hezekiah without doubt. But it can't just refer to Hezekiah, okay? And let's look at this. The virgin is with child. Yeah, we know. Maiden means virgin. I mean, back then, a maiden just didn't know a man at the time, and so they got married when they were a virgin. The Greek-speaking Jews, when they translated the Hebrew, they translated the word Alma, maiden, into Parthenos, virgin. Virgin shall bear a son. All right? Now, the word Emmanuel, so that's a, a, a very important thing to point out. It's the word really is not just a maid, not just some girl, but really a virgin. And then we got this issue of Emmanuel. This, now, um, this, a person's name is very important. We spent a lot of time back in Exodus chapter 3. Remember talking about the importance of a name? Your name reveals something about your identity. 
And I really like how uh, one professor from Steubenville says, uh, his name is John Bergsma, like, Emmanuel, God with us, is not like a nickname for Hezekiah. Like, his buddies weren't, like, hanging out with him, playing Legos, like, hey, God with us, come out, we're building a tower, let's go kick some kickball and play in the field of Emmanuel, let's go. Like, no, like, Hezekiah is God with us to a certain degree. And yes, the maiden will bear a son, that's true. But to really fulfill, in other words, the word itself, to fulfill, to fill up fully, it can't refer to Hezekiah. It's got to be something greater. It's got to be a greater sign. And that is an actual virgin who does not know man, who who takes a vow of chastity, conceives and bears a son. Now that is miraculous. It's not so miraculous for any old girl to bear a son. That happens every single day. All right. And then the other thing, Emmanuel. Jesus Christ's name fulfills that meaning much more perfectly. God with us because Jesus is God and he is with us. And Hezekiah just can't fit the bill. Does that make sense? It's important to understand that because this is one of the most beautiful and powerful prophecies of the coming of Christ. So yes, it refers to Hezekiah, but Hezekiah himself is a type of Christ. So I just want to spend a little bit of time on that because often that's just sort of thrown to the gutter and saying, oh, no, no, it can't refer to Christ. But now all of you understand that it does. Okay? All right. So that's what happens. Now, of course, Hezekiah is born. All right? Hezekiah is born. And chapter 18, verse 2 and 4, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Just as his ancestor David had done. He trusted in the God of Israel so that there was no one like him among all the kings of Judah after him or among those who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord had commanded Moses. So that's in a very real but imperfect way. He is God with Israel. He's God with us because he was a faithful, godly king. Okay? He was a great reformer. He pulled down all the high places. He pulled down the temples. He, he, he got rid of all the cultic prostitution um, ceremonies and rites. He also destroyed the bronze serpent. Remember in the wanderings in the desert, Moses erected the bronze serpent. Surprise, surprise, the Israelites started worshiping it. All right, so he had to destroy that. He was a very good king. And, uh, and God was with him. I mean, if you continue to read the story of, of Hezekiah from chapter 16, I'm sorry, uh, chapter 18, 19, and 20, the, uh, the, the, the Assyrian army comes into Judah and basically lays waste to the entire land, except for Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the only city left. The Assyrian, I, I already said, remember, Assyria was the growing world power. And there's this, uh, this general here, Sennacherib, who's mocking the people. He's saying, I think it's the case, I don't remember, saying you're going to eat feces and drink urine. You're, you're, gonna, you're going down. What does Hezekiah do? Does he go down to Egypt and try to establish an alliance with Egypt? He goes and prays. He goes and consults Isaiah. Isaiah, what should we do? What does God have in store for us? And Isaiah says, don't worry about it. God will take care of Sennacherib. And sure enough, it happens. There's this great plague that erupts in the, in the uh, army. And he has to go back home to Assyria. And he's killed in some sort of coup d'etat. God took care of Hezekiah because Hezekiah placed his trust in God. All right. So too did Hezekiah, if you keep reading, he got ill, deathly ill. So much so that Isaiah said to him, put your house in order, you're going to die. And Hezekiah cried to the Lord, prayed to the Lord, and asked for life. So just as Isaiah was leaving the courtyard, God said to him, Go back, tell Hezekiah he's got 15 more years to live. He's a righteous man. God listens to his prayer because of his obedience. Okay? Unfortunately, however, after he's healed, the Babylon, Assyria, Assyria is kind of dwindling as a world power. And who is growing? Babylon. And the envoys come down to see Hezekiah to congratulate him over, you know, for defeating and rather resisting the siege from the Assyrians. And Hezekiah takes these Babylonian envoys into all his temple, to the temple, into all of his palaces, and shows them everything that he's got, all the beautiful gold and everything that that he has. And Isaiah says, Why did you do that? You are trying you are showing off. You are trying to display your power and your wealth. In, uh, in, in things, in gold, in, in riches, but not in God. So everything that you showed the Babylonians, the Babylonians will take when they destroy the city. And unfortunately, here at the death, uh, the death of Hezekiah, he says, 
Why not? So long as there's peace in my days, fine, let it happen. I just I hate that line right there. He's like, okay, so long as it's in my son's days, then, and I got peace in my time, okay, fine, let it happen. I'm just I have a big unhappy face right here in my Bible. Actually, I have two, one in pencil, one in pen. It's just sad, just how he dies. But he is a righteous king. He's not perfect. His son is Manasseh. He's the son of Hezekiah, and he is the most wicked king of them all. Okay? He is like the Ahaz of the north, Ahaz the husband of Jezebel. He rebuilt everything that his father tore down. He rebuilt the high places. He rebuilt the shrines, the altars. He brought back the male cult prostitution rites and all this stuff. He even burned his children to Molech. And this is a, a picture here. So here we got, I don't know if it's specifically referring to King Manasseh or not, but basically you've got this big golden shrine here, and his hands are out, like you see. And what the people would do is put the infant on the hands, strap it down so it can't get off, and lay wood all around the aisle and light it on fire. So you can see these poor kids right here are like, well, this is bad. This is real bad. They're scared. Everyone else is worshiping. They're lighting the fire. That's what they did. All right? Molech. It's like, could you, they deserved what they got, okay? I just, the sins were so, so horrible and so wicked. So what we see here is because of his sins, of Manasseh's sins, Jerusalem's fate is sealed. Chapter 21, verses 12 to 15, God says, Therefore says the Lord, the God of Israel, I am bringing upon Jerusalem and Judah such evil that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. I will stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line for Samaria. In other words, it will be like Samaria, okay? Because at this point, Samaria is long gone. That's important to point out. Samaria is gone. Which helps to explain, by the way, why the Syrian army was now down in Jerusalem, right? Because once you move from north to south, it's just for, the, for a while, the north was just a buffer. Does that make sense? All right, so I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, t- wiping it, turning it upside down. I will cast off the remnant of my heritage and give them into the, land of their, into the hand of their enemies. They shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies, because they have done what is evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger, since the day their ancestors came out of Egypt, even to this day. And sure enough, this is what's going to happen. Now, what happens with Manasseh, this is, again, you've got the wickedness of the people, but the mercy and the compassion of God. Manasseh was ultimately carried away in chains. He was defeated. The city wasn't destroyed, but he was defeated. And while he was being carried away in chains, he had a great conversion experience. I have the reference here for you in the notes. Uh, it is uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 33. He has this great conversion experience. And he implores the Lord for mercy. He asks for forgiveness. And he basically has a, a 180 experience. And God frees him. And God allows him to go back to Jerusalem. And what does he do when he gets back to Jerusalem? No, he did right. Just, I, that was a, I, I led you down the wrong path there. He actually tore down everything. He, he, he tore down everything that he built, and he actually lived the rest of his days as a righteous king. But Jerusalem's fate was still sealed. Punishment still had to come for their wickedness. You can have forgiveness of their sins, but the punishment must still come. That's very important to point out when you talk. I don't have time to talk about it right now, but all sin has dual punishment. Eternal punishment and temporal punishment. When we go to confession, our eternal punishment is forgiven. We'll go to heaven, we might have to pass through a little purging fire first. I dare say most of us will. But we might have to still undergo some sort of temporal punishment, whatever that might be, to teach us to love, to teach us to sacrifice for other people. I could say a whole lot more about that, but I must resist. All right, now Manasseh ended well, but Jerusalem's fate is sealed. His son is Josiah, the great reformer king. Here's the second great reformer king of of the south, all right? He walked in the way of the Lord. Here we have 2 Kings 22.2. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord, and he walked in all the way of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right or to the left. He kept going straight. And he was very, and he was, he was honored for that. He tore down all the altars. He tore down the high places. He dissipated all the different uh, cultic rites and all that stuff. He was very good. And then at one particular point here, in chapter 22, something interesting happens. The high priest Hilkiah. He's kind of doing some work in the temple, kind of opens up a broom closet. It's not really a broom closet. He opens up a broom closet and pulls out this this manuscript, these scrolls. What is this? <sighs> Blows it off. 
it's the law of Deuteronomy. It's the law of Moses. It's like, where'd this come from? You know, you sort of like, it's maybe like when you got came to the Bible study, like, where's that Bible? Pull out that Bible. You know, no, I'm just teasing with you. Just, <laughs> just roll with me a little bit. All right, anyways, that did not go over as well as it did a lot. And yesterday, yesterday was great. Everyone laughed. But anyways, uh, Josiah, the Hilkiah, the high priest, found this law that had been forgotten most probably under Manasseh, Josiah's father, and Josiah reads it. And in verse 11 of chapter 22, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. And he, the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam the son of Shaphan, and Akbar the son of Micaiah, and other people, go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people, and for all of Judah, concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath that the Lord has kindled against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So he has this key, he knows the sins of his father, and he is afraid, because you go back and read Deuteronomy, the cur- we went through that, right? Remember that? The curses of the covenant, they're laid right there, and the people said, well, take the curses, don't worry, we'll obey the Lord, and Moses is like, yeah, right. He knows they weren't going to do it, and Josiah sees what's coming down the pike, and uh, God sends a prophetess, a woman prophet, Hulda, and basically she says, yes, Jerusalem will be destroyed, the temple will be destroyed because of the sins of your fathers, but because of your righteousness, because of your penance, you will live in peace. And then Josiah continues on uh, with all of his different reforms. All right. Unfortunately, he died very young in battle with Pharaoh. The Egyptian Pharaoh, his name is Necho. You can read all about that in chapter 23. He dies very young, and the people mourn for him. They really loved Josiah. He was a reformer king, and he really served the people as the king was supposed to serve the people. Not oppress them, not be a tyrant, but love them and serve them as the bridegroom should serve the bride. All right, you all with me so far? All right. Kind of interesting? Yeah. Yeah, good. All right, so chapter 5, last page of the notes. Here we notice at this time, Jeremiah, the great prophet, uh, Zephaniah, and a little bit later, Ezekiel, they come into play. This is how you're going to contextualize the prophets. You go back and read the prophets with this history in place, it'll make sense to you. Okay? Now, the next king is uh, Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim is Josiah's son. Did he walk in the ways of his father? No, he was very wicked. So in 605, Nebuchadnezzar, now the king of Babylon, came and took Jerusalem and made Jehoiakim his vassal for three years. This is the, if you notice, actually take a look at your your charts again, please. And you're going to notice, if you've got them right there before you, in, in the sections of the divided kingdom and the exile, the southern kingdom, the, the purple kingdom, you know, you see it goes a lot longer than the north. Does everyone see that? Because the northern kingdom was destroyed in 722, and the southern kingdom continued for a ways on after that. But you'll notice when it ends, what they have here is a little box that says three deportations. Do you see that? This is the first deportation in 605 under King Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim with an M. Like, mommy, mommy. Jehoiakim. Okay? 605, Nebuchadnezzar come, took some people away. And uh, Daniel, which we're, we're going to talk about him next week, was one of the people taken away in exile at this point. Now, Jehoiakim, with the M, all right, he rebelled, and he died while Jerusalem was being besieged yet again. And in 597, eight years later, Nebuchadnezzar took his son, Jehoiakim, with an N, like, manna, manna, okay? It gets confusing, I know. Just one letter throws you all off, but... Jehoiakim, his son, is taken into Babylon in chains. That's the second deportation. And Baruch and Ezekiel are taken in that deportation, okay? We'll talk more about this next week when we discuss the exile. All right? You all with me? Fantastic. So, that is King Jehoiakim. Now, what Nebuchadnezzar did is he made Zedekiah, another son of Josiah, sort of this vassal, this puppet king. All right? He was... He was bad, and he wanted to rebel against Nebuchadnezzar. He was sinful. He wanted to rebel. Jeremiah said, don't rebel. Admit that you're going to be defeated. In fact, Jeremiah wore a wooden yoke on his neck to prophesy and symbolize with his own... Don't read that yet, please. (laughs) Uh, To symbolize that they're going to have to submit to the yoke of Babylon, right? 
And these false prophets would come and take this wooden yoke off Jeremiah's neck and smash it to pieces and prophesy falsely that they would have victory. So Jeremiah would have to go and get an iron yoke and say, if you do not not accept what's coming, then it's going to be even heavier. And So you see yet another example of these prophets prophesying in word and deed. I'll say one more example about that. Ezekiel also prophesied. What God told him to do was shave his head with his sword, just completely bald, shaved his head, and he took a hair. Let's see if I remember this correctly. He took one third of the hair and he struck it with the sword. You can imagine him running around striking the hair with the sword, okay? He took another third and he burned it, his hair. And he took another third of his hair and threw it to the wind. And the people, what are you doing? He said, this is what's going to happen to you. One third of you will die by the sword. One third of you will die by fire. And another third of you will be scattered to the winds. Prophets prophesying in word and deed. Pretty interesting, right? Okay, so uh, Zedekiah did rebel. That's just what he decided to do. And uh, what we have here is we're talking about in, in 2 Kings 25 what happened. He rebelled, and the city was besieged until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. It took a while, but it happened. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine became so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then a breach was made in the city wall, and the king with all the soldiers fled by night by the way of the gate between the two walls, by the king's garden, through the, though the Chaldeans were all around the city. All right, this is it. The, the wall's breached, the people are getting in, and he flees. Now, if you keep reading here in chapter 25, you'll notice... Um, Yeah, I actually want to keep reading. That stopped in verse 4. But in verse 5, I want to continue. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho. That's very important. They overtook him in the plains of Jericho. And all of his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king, brought him up to the king of Babylon in Riblah, who passed sentence upon him. They slew the sons of Zedekiah, the heirs, okay, before his eyes, and then put out the eyes of the king and bound him in fetters and took him to Babylon. So the last thing he saw were his sons being killed before him. Basically, what does that mean? It means he has no heir anymore. The line is cut off. Okay? Now, what's interesting here is that the people of Israel have come full circle. Remember, they came... Way back when, under Joshua, they came into the promised land to take possession of it at Jericho. Jericho was the beginning of the conquest. Now, they've come full circle. The last king of Israel is captured at Jericho. Then his sons are killed and he's hauled off into exile. And they no longer have possession of the land. See that? Jericho to Jericho. Not only that, Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldeans. All right? From Babylon. Now, he, then he was called to come into the promised land. And then what happened? Now, just, we just read about, they're carried back into Babylon, into exile. Yet another full circle. God has to start all over with them later and try to bring them back. We're going to look at that next time, the exile and the return. But what you're going to discover, even though they return physically, their hearts don't return to the Lord. They don't, they're still in spiritual exile. They're still in sin. Which is, of course, what Jesus will do as the king of As the king of Israel, the king of uh, the son of David, he will restore all of that again. Are you with me? How they've come full circle? Okay, great. Now, Jerusalem is burning. I really went a while. Just look at that. Just it keeps going and going. The temple's burning. Temple's burning. Just it kept burning. It it was bad. Really want to emphasize something with that. When the when the city of God and the temple of God was destroyed, the people. The people never thought that would happen. The people thought, we've got the temple. We've got the Ark of the Covenant. No one's going to defeat us. And sure enough, it was. And so it was. you cannot begin to imagine the catastrophe that this meant for the people of Judah. And ultimately, of course, for all the Israelites. But, you know, the temple's destroyed. It just kept burning and it's gone. Jeremiah, luckily, took the Ark of the Covenant and hid it in a cave somewhere. No one knows where it is. There are no Raiders of the Lost Ark. That was completely fiction, if you didn't know that before. What's this guy's name again, the actor? Come on. Harrison, Harrison Ford. I couldn't remember it. All right, Harrison Ford did not find it. It's gone. And that's in Second Maccabees chapter 2. Jeremiah took it and hid it. And the temple in the city was destroyed completely. 
And that's it. And that was the third deportation in 587. That is when the, the city was sacked and burned to the ground. 587. And we'll come back again next week and look at it in a little bit more detail. But what I'd like to do is talk about Isaiah and Jeremiah really quickly. Just point out a couple of really awesome prophecies that they give to the people. Not only just that, and we've discussed already before, that the city is going to burn, but that God will be faithful to them and will bring them back. Even though the line of David has apparently been cut off. All right, what we're going to see in a moment is called the tree of Jesse. All right, Jesse is David's father. Even though that's been cut off and it seems like the Davidic line has been snuffed out, God will bring a son of David back again. Okay? We're just going to look at a few things. If you can, open up to Isaiah chapter 9. If you've got quick fingers. If you were raised a Baptist, you're going to get there quickly, I'm sure. If you were raised a Catholic, we'll just, you know, they'll find it. I'm awful, I know. It's all in good fun. Come on. Isaiah chapter 9. We already discussed Isaiah chapter 7, right? This, uh, the, the, the virgin will bear a son, right? That's a very beautiful po- a prophecy. And here in Isaiah chapter 9, what we have, you're going to recognize, maybe one of you might want to sing it, Handel's Messiah, you know, the, the beautiful prophecy that Handel put to music, Handel's Messiah, okay? What I'd like to do is start in verse 1 and just read around a little bit and point out a couple of things here. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1, says, In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. This is Isaiah 9, verse 1. Verse 2, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined. You recognize this? We read it every Advent. All right, what is so important about this? The land of Zebulun and Naphtali, the land of Galilee. This was the fir- I didn't point this out. It's in your notes. Maybe you saw it. But this w- these were the first places that the Assyrian army came and destroyed. So gradually, the Assyrian army picked away at the northern kingdom. Little here, little there. Okay, And the land of Zebulun and Naphtali were the first to go. So what Isaiah is prophesying is that they are going to be the first ones. The land of Galilee are going to be the first ones to see the light. Jesus is born in Nazareth of Galilee. And if you read carefully in the Gospels, he begins his ministry in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. In other words, he is going to restore the kingdom of David exactly where it started to decay, where it began to fall apart. Does that make sense? Are you with me? I see a couple of confu- uh, confused faces. That's my reading. It's okay. Oh, okay. All right, so if you're all with me, that's what Jesus is doing. He's going to begin the restoration where the deportation began, all right? And then if you go on, verse 6, it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government, here's the song, right? Can you hear it? And the government will be on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of his peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. That's beautiful, right? Remember, the throne of David will be brought back. And again, just to point out uh, Dr. Bergsma's um, very important point is that these names of the of the son of David are very important names. I mean, wonderful counselor, mighty God. This is not just some mere man. Hey, wonderful counselor, come on and play with us. We're going to go, I don't know, uh, do something we shouldn't do. I don't know. You know, you get the point? It, the name is the essence of the person. This can only refer to some sort of God man. To to really be fulfilled. Same thing with Isaiah 7, and now we're looking at Isaiah 9. There's so much in Isaiah. It can only be referred to somebody who is wonderful counselor, who is mighty God, and who is the son of David at the same time. You get that? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sorry I didn't sing it for you, but it is what it is. So now flip two chapters to chapter 11. Again, the same theme, the stump of Jesse, chapter 11, verse 1. There shall come forth... 
a shoot from the stump of Jesse, a branch will will grow out of its roots. And this this branch, the spirit of the Lord, will rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom, of understanding, of counsel and might, of knowledge and fear of the Lord. It's the sevenfold spirit. Okay? And that his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. This is a prophecy that even though Zedekiah was called off in chains and his sons were killed, the stump or the tree of Jesse has been cut down, God will bring a righteous branch out of this stump and the spirit of the Lord will be upon him he will be anointed he will be the Meshiach the Messiah the son of David alright do these prophecies now make a little bit more sense hopefully here's one other thing the branch what is does anybody know off chance what branch is in Hebrew give you brownie we don't have brownies give you brownie points Netzer Netzer is the word for branch in Hebrew Nazareth is a derivation of Netzer, Netzereth, okay? Nazareth is like Branch Town, Branchylvania, all right? It's uh, Branchville, whatever you want, okay? Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the son of David, is coming from a town named Branch, all right? Do you get that? This is powerful stuff, all right? Number two, pardon me, number three, the suffering servant, Isaiah chapter 53, this is really beautiful as well. There are four. Isaiah is incredible. You know Isaiah is called the fifth gospel? It's called the fifth gospel because his prophecies of the Messiah were so incredibly accurate regarding Christ. It's as if he was the fifth gospel. He wrote the fifth gospel. And Isaiah chapter 53 highlights that. There are other servant songs. The servant of the Lord would suffer in order to redeem Israel and to forgive them of their sins, to atone for their iniquity. Now, Isaiah was the most uh, quoted and most read book after the psalm. So, it's a very, very important book. Now, in Isaiah 53, I'm just going to read a little bit, just to give you a few few goosebumps, but I encourage you to read it on your own, okay? Talking about this suffering servant, this Messiah, the son of David, and it's all connected together. It says, starting in verse 2, For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. That root is, is... talking about the root. I just noticed that by the way. I don't know why I never noticed that before. See, you just learn something all the time. It's no coincidence that this suffering servant is like a root coming out of a dry ground. Anyway, so there you go. He had no form or comeliness that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom mid hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our, our, our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And it goes on. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. That is, I can't tell you how many uh, Jewish people have converted to Christianity because of that. You cannot read that and not see Jesus Christ. And this is the Messiah, the son of David, that Isaiah prophesies about. If a couple things to say about Jeremiah, then that's it. We should call it a night. <laughs> Dare say, I see a lot of yawns. I'm bombarding you. Don't feel bad. I see everything from up here. Just like Father sees it when you read the, when you read the bulletin. Father sees you reading the bulletin out there, okay? We see everything from up here. <laughs> Anyways, Jeremiah. Jeremiah prophesied 70 years of exile. He, Jeremiah was carried off... Um, down, down to Egypt, as a matter of fact. You read the last chapter of Second Kings, as well as Jeremiah himself. Jeremiah was saying, no, just accept it. It's coming. Your city is going to be burned. And uh, some of the few people that remained rebelled yet again. They killed the man. I forget his name. I'd have to go back and look. They killed the man whom Nebuchadnezzar had set up as his viceroy. They killed him, assassinated him, and then hauled Jeremiah, kicking and screaming, down to Egypt. And while he's kicking and screaming, Jeremiah is saying, Nebuchadnezzar is going to find you down here. You can run, but you can't hide. And sure enough, later, Nebuchadnezzar came down and took Egypt as well. In any case, uh, 
the exile was going to be for 70 years, he prophesied. And of course, that's what happened. We'll come back to that next week, sure enough. And if you look at, I, I, Jeremiah is the very next book, okay? So just open up to Jeremiah chapter 30 and 31. What we, what we have... In the midst of all this doom and gloom, and you can even just see this, uh, this picture right here of Jeremiah. He's moaning and groaning because he was lament, lamenting the whole time and he had a lot to lament about. And in the midst of all this lamenting in the book of Jeremiah, uh, chapters, pardon me, chapters 30 to 33, there's these great restoration oracles that God is going to restore Israel. He's going to bring them back from exile. All the tribes, not just Judah, but all the tribes eventually. And what we have in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, is the prophecy of a new covenant. And this is extremely important. A prophecy of a new covenant. The Israelites would never have thought of there being a new covenant before. And this is what it says, 3131. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In other words, with both houses, with both kingdoms, with all the tribes. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. In other words, not like Sinai. Jesus will not renew the Sinai covenant. He's going to renew the Davidic covenant, okay? Because remember, the Sinai covenant, the Sinai law, is imperfect. It's concessionary, okay? My covenant which they broke, and I showed myself their master. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each man teach his neighbor. So I'll be out of a job then. Uh, no longer shall each man teach his neighbor. Not even a couple chuckles there? No? Oh, okay. And each brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. And I will forgive them of their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is when the law of God, the covenant, will be written on our hearts. And this is the passage that Jesus refers to when he talks about the new and everlasting covenant in his blood at the Last Supper. He's going to fulfill that prophecy right there. The next thing is a new exodus. You read in chapter 32, verses 20, 36 and to 41. Now therefore says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the city which you say it is given into the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, famine, and pestilence. Behold, this is important, behold, I will gather them from all the countries to which I drove them in my anger and in my wrath. And in great indignation, I will bring them back to this place, and I will make them dwell in safety, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever, for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make with them an everlasting covenant. There's that covenant again. And I will not turn away from doing good to them, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts, that they may not turn from me. Okay, this is the new exodus. Remember, now all the tr- we're going back to ground zero. Just like before when the Israelites were in a foreign land in slavery, now all the Israelites are in foreign lands. You know, and some in servitude to the, to the various kings, all right, and some just have been disappeared. All right, we call them the, lo- the ten lost tribes of Israel. We'll talk more about that next week. God is going to say, I'm going to bring them back. I'm going to bring them back in a new exodus. I'm going to restore the kingdom. This is everything that Jesus is doing. Okay, And then finally, I'll just mention this in passing, Jeremiah 2, and Jeremiah also, in other words, speaks about this righteous branch that will come forth out of the stump of Jesse. It's right there, Jeremiah 33, 15. It's very, very important because, as I was saying, you cannot underestimate the horror for the Jews in seeing their king being killed, their, the, the, the king being carried off in exile and all the heirs slaughtered before him. For them, it's like, where is God? He has abandoned us, but he has not abandoned them. He's going to restore their kingdom again. He's going to bring back the son of David. Which brings us to next week's topic, the exile and the return. We only got two more weeks left, all right? And then that's an overview of the New Testament. So I know, true to form, I bombarded you with a lot of information, but they're broad strokes. You've got the notes. You can always go back and listen to them again. But I hope that gives you a good overview now of the divided kingdom. We've seen how it was united through the work of Samuel, then Saul, David, and Solomon. And that was short-lived. And now we've seen how the, the kingdom split, right? The northern kingdom fell into sin. It was destroyed by Assyria. 
And then the southern kingdom was also destroyed ultimately by Babylon. Do you all have a good overview of all that? I don't know if it's snowing or not. Is it snowing now, Father Paul? Uh, it's starting to come. All right. Well, thank you all for braving the storm. We do have 10 minutes. I'd, if you have any questions, or if you're just sick of me now, you want to leave. But if you have any questions, you have any comments, by all